Actually, I'm going to bring Dr. Fulkerson up here next, and uh, but let me just make sure there's no online questions before I do that. And I will um, let you guys stay up there and have first dibs at Dr. Fulkerson. Is that okay? <laughs> All right. Any Anybody online, Mary Jo? Okay. Uh, I'm going to introduce Patty Fulkerson. She is our next speaker. She's from Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Medical Center, and she is in the Division of Allergy and Immunology. Her research program focuses on, on identifying defining events that control eosinophil development, functional responses at a molecular level. This could go on for a long time because she does a lot of stuff. But her overall aim of her research is to develop novel targets to block eosinophil production. So her, the goal of her research is to find new, new treatments for all of you. And she's going to discuss pediatric and adult hyper eosinophilic syndromes. And uh, she will stay up here to address your questions about hyper eosinophilic syndromes specifically. Thank you, Dr. Fulkerson. Hello. Um, I just want to thank APFED for um, inviting me to talk about uh, pediatric hyperusinophilic syndrome and versus adult. Let's see. Do I push this? Uh, no, on the laptop. On the laptop, okay. So, um, as we've heard, I've had some nice uh, intro talks before me. So. Um, Mild eosinophilia is defined in different ways. The, the classical is mild is greater than 500 to 1500, moderate and severe, you can see there. But what's different is in those uh, definitions are really adult defined. And uh, what I'd like to show is this graph. This is the normal um, upper level, level of normal for an absolute eosinophil count in the blood of kids from three days old down to uh, to the adults, and you can see in a three-day-old, it's pretty normal to have an AC of 1,200. And as you go down, as you get older, it goes starts to go down. So in the pediatric world, <clears throat> it takes a little higher number for me to be concerned about eosinophilia than it would in, in the adult side. But I just like to throw that up there because people don't think about that in terms of the pediatric world. Blood eosinophilia, like I said, is the definition is greater than 500. Hyper eosinophilia is greater than 1,500 on two, uh, two times separated by at least four weeks and or tissue eosinophilia. And as you've heard, the definitions of hyper eosinophilic syndrome is that hyper eosinophilia along with dysfunction of an organ or um, as a result of the eosinophils that are there. And with that, I sort of think of my job in clinic is to understand cause and consequence. So the, the idea is that you want to identify the cause of the eosinophilia and try to determine if there's any consequence of the eosinophilia as well. And so this is sort of my list that I go through, uh, whether it's a primary cause or a secondary cause, and there's this list of secondary causes that are common to cause eosinophilia, and then understand trying to, the consequence side, looking at tissue in, infiltration, trying to determine of course, the big ones are cardiac and neurologic because of the devastating consequences that becomes of that. And then going down the stream, what tests can I do to identify? Um, what questions can I ask to try to figure out where to go, what tests to order, and, um, and try to go through sort of systematically um, trying to figure out, again, cause and consequence. Um, the big issue, the difference between peds and adults, is this list of secondary causes. So primary disease, hyperosynophilic syndrome, um, whether it's idiopathic, myeloid, lymphoid, lymphocytic, um, their diagnosis is the same. The secondary causes is where it differs. And this list of infectious, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, atopic disease, hypersensitivity, those are the things that I think of first. And if I was a, but if I was an adult, Allergist or immunologist, it would probably be a little different in terms of be much more malignancy would be up higher and things like that. So different approach. The difference between pediatric and adult hyperosynophilic syndrome has uh, there's not a lot out there in terms in the literature uh, for those of us who see these patients. The biggest uh, comparison has been actually done by 
Dr. Klingon's group because uh, the, the patients that are referred there. And so you can see there was over, I don't know how many years this was, um, there's 37 kids they had with hyperacinophilia of some sort and compared to 254 adults. So you can see that it's much more common in adults versus uh, children. And the, what I'm showing you here are the clinical variants uh, that, were, that were diagnosed with. And you can see the biggest group is the idiopathic hyperacinophilic syndrome. And there's really no difference between the two groups in terms of the clinical variants. Um, where the difference between the pediatrics and adults, again, was the secondary causes. And the, of course, the most com more common in kids was the immune deficiency um, because that's diagnosed earlier in kids than it is in adults. So that's where the difference is, this is the secondary causes, again. So same overlap uh, of frequency, although there's trends for differences, they weren't significant in their population. In terms of consequences, so where were the eosinophils going in the difference between the pediatric and adult patients? You can see uh, the gastrointestinal system. It's much more commonly seen in children than adults. And then in pulmonary infiltration, it's much more common seen in adults versus children. So that's really where the difference lies. Otherwise, there's not a whole lot of difference between pediatric and adult patients with hyperacinophilic syndrome. So this, published, this, this was published, I guess, last year, uh, two years ago, no, 2016. Um, and so my question was, is this representative of what we see at Cincinnati Children's Hospital? So whenever you see a study that's published at a one institution, like the NIH, you know there's what's something we call referral bias. So as you can imagine, the patients that get referred to the NIH are probably more uh, serious, more um, difficult in terms of uh, understanding the diagnosis than seen out in sort of the wild, uh, the rest of the, the practices. At Cincinnati Children's, I probably wouldn't say we're our tertiary referral center as well, so we're going to have a referral bias as well. But I, I know from experience doing uh, presentations with um, Dr. Cleon and others, adult, that there's definitely a difference, like I said, in terms of our approach to um, ruling out secondary causes and other things. So we did at uh, our place just recently, and this is data that we've just, uh, we're just still in the process of analyzing, but I thought it would be interesting to share with you, is that we went back through our CBCs with DIFF at our hospitals over the past five years and looked for individuals who met the criteria for pediatric, uh, for hyperacinophilia. So anybody who was zero to 18 years old, who had an absolute eosinophil count of 1,500 or greater on two occasions that were separated by four weeks apart, but no more than six months because we, um, we didn't know if that was just intermittent or what. So that was our definition. And then we sort of we got all comers based on that. So it was an unbiased review. And what we found was about over 170 kids. I don't know if you follow well, you can see that. 170 kids who met that criteria. And it really was about 50-50 male and female. So there wasn't the male predominance that we expected. And if you look at the age of diagnosis, we got a pretty split between all the age groups, under 1, 1 to 2, 3 to 5, 6 to 11, and 12 to 17. So we were seeing it at all ages. There's no, the median age was 4.6 years. And the race um, and ethnicity is sort of representative of what our patient population is that we see at Cincinnati Children's. What we figured out is about 15 individuals meet the criteria for hyperacinophilia. Again, this isn't hyperacinophilic syndrome, this is just hyperacinophilia uh, per year at our institution. Now I showed you that graph where you see the um, higher eosinophils at baseline in the younger kids, and it goes down as you get older, and we sort of wanted to see whether the peak or uh, absolute eosinophil count in these kids who have hyperacinophilia, is that age dependent? There seems to be a trend that's higher in the younger ones and it goes down a little bit as, as they get older. Of course, the diagnosis frequency, that was the uh, main thing, because our goal really was to, with this um, study, is, to, is for education of other providers. So what are things that we should be thinking about when you have a, a patient in front of you who's a, pedi uh, who's a kid, a child, who has hyperacinophilia? So how can we, what, what are the things that you need to think of first? And as you can see, one of the top ones is atopic dermatitis, so eczema. So we see a lot of very severe eczema. I, have, I do a severe eczema clinic, so a lot of these kids 
do have really high eosinophil counts, and that's sort of underappreciated, I think, by a lot of physicians how high it goes. Uh, second most common is uh, graft versus host disease. We are a transplant center at Cincinnati Children's, so, and that's well known that eosinophilia is associated with that, so that wasn't a too big surprise. Our next biggest group really is overlap HES. And so as you heard earlier this morning, what is overlap HES? In our case, actually all 11 of those kids are, have eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorder. And that's a referral bias, because that's one thing that our center does, specializes is eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders. So those kids have that. One thing I do want to say is that a lot of, some of these kids are not, they don't respond to typical EJ treatment, so there's not diet therapy. We treat it more like a systemic, like an HES in some of these kids. And some of these kids are, uh, do respond to antigen removal or diet therapy. The other one, uh, the big surprise to us was actually the sickle cell disease group. And so this patient group, which I hadn't appreciated before, was um, has uh, spikes of eosinophilia with infection, which is different. And what that means uh, immunologically, I don't know, but that's something we'll, we'll continue to look for. You can see some farther down, parasitic infection is, again, is a, a big one in the peds population. Just to get an appreciation of what the AAC looks like in the different groups, you can see what I'm showing you here, these are our minimum and maximum. So the maximum, the upper, is the maximum uh, AAC that we found in our record. And the line across in the box is the median. And then the lower one is the minimum. So you can see the parasitic infection, you get actually get some really high eosinophil counts. And then the other ones are EGIB, eczema, and asthma, you can see are, are on the lower end, but still abnormally high. One of the things we learned about in going through the records is, again, I think uh, Dr. Kleon saw the same thing, that Toxicara species are the most common parasitic infection. We found it actually associated with lead poisoning. So these, the kids are, have lead poisoning, they develop pica, which means that they eat things that are not food, especially dirt, and they get uh, Toxicara infections that way. So that's something that the pediatricians are, um, at least we became more aware of. And so this is the, the whole group of the ACs with the different diagnoses. And what you can appreciate is that, again, the parasitic infection has a, has a really wide range, but probably one of the highest ones. And again, the median of the neoplasm group is, is probably the highest one of all. But as you can see, it, it, it's spread out quite a bit, depending on the different diagnosis. So the limitation of us doing it this way, sort of in this unbiased uh, look at our study, is that we miss the patients who come in, are so sick that we treat them before they meet that criteria for hyperacinophilia. And I know there are several patients that I have seen, uh, such as um, uh, adolescents who have had been diagnosed with EGPA sort of after the fact, because they were so sick we needed to treat them. And then anybody who was over 18 years of old, old even we see, still see those patients. Uh, so it's, we have a glyc syndrome, we have some lymphocytic HES that I see that of course, didn't meet our criteria for um, in the pediatric population. And there's some other ones. We don't see the ones that come in for second opinions and things like that that I see in clinic because they don't have more than one CDC, so they wouldn't meet. So that's a limitation of our study. But I think that this will be informative uh, in a variety of ways for the groups that are out there, um, for other clinicians who are seeing getting referrals for patients for eosinophilia that are children. So again, this sort of cause and consequence, the cause, sort of the, the order would probably change a little bit after our study for me in terms of, number one, think of atopic disease infection in EGID. So number one would be atopic disease, since eczema and asthma cause pretty high levels in children. And then hypersensitivity, the drug reaction, which we didn't talk about. Immune deficiency is still there, but it's rare. And then, of course, malignancy is, is far down, because we just don't see that too much in the pediatric world. And so what we're going to do is what, what characteristics of these different secondary causes and even the primary diseases that's unique in children that will help us sort of reach diagnosis quicker than it does often takes uh, for some of these kids because I'm not usually the first doctor that they see. They've also come through a, a wide variety of um, usually at least two other physicians before they get to us, especially for the EGIDs. So what have we learned? Pediatric hyperacinophilia is seen in all ages, uh, from under one to through the 18 years of age. 
Top ones are, again, eczema, egids, grass host and parasitic infection. The surprises were sickle cell disease for us and what that means immunologically, I think, is an interesting question. And then, of course, our other biggest group, which I didn't mention, is the other. So we don't know what causes um, the, the hyperacinophilia, and sometimes it went away without any treatment whatsoever. And I do have a couple of kids who have the eosinophilia of uh, unknown consequences where they're running in the 3,000, 5,000 range, and I can't find any evidence for tissue infiltration, so I'm just sort of watching them over time. Uh, so this is our email address for um, our CCD, and you'll, the message will get to me that way. It's probably the easiest way to, to get a hold of me if you have any questions, and of course I'll be happy to take any questions you have today. Um, I was uh, diagnosed <clears throat> around eight years old with henoch schonlein purpura, mm -hmm. and I'm now questioning if that's what it actually was, but because I don't have a lot of memory of it. Uh, but I'm just curious if you've ever seen a correlation between HES or any of the eosinophilic disorders and uh, HSP. I haven't seen I haven't seen the correlation between HSP, but I have seen earlier events um, that seem to spark an eosinophilia that just doesn't go away after that. Um, that's probably more common what we see in the kids, that we end up having to treat the eosinophilia after that whatever the original, um, so mostly it's usually infection with the kids, and it just doesn't go away, it persists. All right. Um, wasn't sure it was on. Uh, one, these are questions from the audience here. Uh, is hyperosinophilic syndrome hereditary? How concerned should a parent be about uh, having a child with it if the parent has it? I don't. I, there are certainly uh, mutations that result in eosinophilia that can be passed on, but whether it results in hyperosinophilic syndrome, I haven't seen that. Amy, have you seen that? It's extraordinarily rare. Um, I would like to find more families. We follow two families with what they call autosomal dominant transmission. So that means that you have a 50% chance of having a child who has eosinophilia. In one of the families, several members of the family died of hyper eosinophilic syndrome. For whatever reason, I've now followed six generations of that family. Nobody else has developed severe disease. They're asymptomatic. But there are reports in the literature, occasional reports of familial transmission of hyper eosinophilic syndrome. It's extraordinarily rare. And we've checked children of a lot of our patients for yeah. exactly that reason. We've checked cord blood in newborns, and we really don't see it. So I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah. It's more common to have like a mutation that results in an immune deficiency that is passed on in the, the eosinophilia is secondary to other issues that result because of that mutation. Those are the type of things that we see like in immune deficiency clinic. Another uh, question relates to things that might cause lymphocytic hyper eosinophilic syndrome. Um, the question comes from a veteran who's wondering if Agent Orange exposure could be a cause or are there other chemicals or drugs that could cause the lymphocytic variant? That is, I am not aware of it, but it's certainly, I would say, an exposure or even infection, theoretically, as an immunologist, this is how I think, it could theoretically result in a clonal T cell pop an abnormal T cell population that results that just doesn't go away. Whether that's ever been proven or shown, I'm not aware of that. Any of you know? <laughs> yeah. 
So, I mean, theoretically it's possible, as Patty said, but there have actually been studies of Agent Orange, and we've had this come up a number of times. There's been no association proven. There, it just doesn't right. seem to be the case. Um, next question is about uh, Nucala. Um, a woman writes that her, or a man, I guess it could be, my son was on Nucala for a year, had anaphylaxis, can't use it anymore. Uh, if you have anaphylaxis to one of these agents, uh, is there concern that they will be allergic to the other agents? And what, what is it about it that causes that allergy? Well, that's, well, it's a protein, so you're putting a foreign protein into uh, your body, so you can develop an allergy to any protein that you administer to yourself in any way. But I would say that that's pretty rare, actually, to have anaphylaxis to one of the anti-L5 agents, It's pretty, uh, which is different than like Zolaire, which is another um, uh, monoclonal that we use in, in practice quite often. I would say that it doesn't, it usually precludes you from having some of the physicians will be hesitant to prescribe the other one, but it's a completely different protein. So it's possible that you would tolerate the other one, the other ones that are in that pathway because it's probably the protein itself. And there's testing that as allergists can do. And there's ways to administer it, to test it as well, to see, to make it more tolerable as well. But that would all have to be done in conjunction with an allergist. All right, and uh, the last question that, that I have um, from the group here is remission possible on benralizumab? And I guess we could look at that two ways, staying on it or inducing remission and coming off of it. For of benralizumab or any of them? Uh, benralizumab was the specific question, but yeah. it would be great if you addressed all of them. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think they've been, uh, well, some of the adults have certainly have been on it for uh, almost 20 years now. And some have been able to come off of it and been in remission. And some of them, and you won't know until you, until you do it until, to see whether it is. Benralizumab, as Dr. Gleick was saying, is, is going to eliminate EOs uh, to a much higher degree in tissues than mepolizumab or rosalizumab, at least has been shown in the studies. Uh, so that will be interesting. Whether that is going to be sufficient to keep you in remission, it, it's just going to depends on what type you have and what's the cause of your eosinophilia, whether that is the case or not. I mean, you, you, every individual is different, so you can't really sort of make a global statement. Uh, one more. Yeah. And let me know if there's anyone on the phone with questions, Mary Jo. Uh, is there any relationship between hyperosinophilic syndrome and natural killer cell deficiency? <laughs> Dr. Corey and I were just there, talking about this actually. Uh, I haven't, I haven't seen that correlation. Although Dr. Corey was just saying that uh, uh, somebody who has uh, an EOE who has an EGID has uh, just diagnosed with the NK cell um, deficiency as well. I haven't seen that very common, and we see a lot of uh, NK cell deficient patients at Cincinnati Children's. And I haven't seen that before, but of course it's not, it certainly is possible. Other questions? All right, thank you.